the notion of the ultimate solution to the Jewish issue. And Jews as a nation, as a race, as a ethnicity, whatever concept you wish to use, were the focus of the Nazi regime. And so too it was with chattel slavery. Chattel slavery focused only on African peoples. The only people <coughs> in the hemisphere, in the world, in the 18th century, who were targeted for enslavement in terms of chattel bondage were African peoples. No other race on the planet. It is true that the native people of this hemisphere did experience forms of enslavement. And the genocide surrounding the indigenous population is quite clear. But the specific form of chattel bondage, uh, which was experienced by African peoples, was designed specifically for them. And this was a global understanding. This was a global understanding. So we can speak then of the specific features of a system that focused upon a particular ethnicity. Now, reparations would always begin with an apology. An apology is a legal concept which says, I admit to my guilt. Now, it's easier to settle the case with money. It's easier to settle the case with affirmative action. It's easy to settle the issue with community empowerment, build schools and hospitals and, and empower, because the concept of reparation is, is, it really in fact needs to repair. And in law it says reparations ought to be paid in order to repair the damage that has been done. And to put the <coughs> victim back in a position that they might have been in without the crime. <laughs> now there lies the problem. How do we, as a people, an African people, how do we demonstrate that we would have been better off today had not forced it? It becomes an interesting counterfactual argument. African Americans are taller. Um, African Americans are healthier. Uh, African Americans are more materially successful. But well-being is not measured in terms of material consumption. Well-being is also measured in terms of loss of identity, loss of dignity, loss of self-esteem, damage done to children, to women, to adults, <coughs> damage done to community, loss of prestige in the world. And one of the issues about slavery, which is significant, is that in societies where there was no African enslavement, such as Japan, in those societies, there is also an anti-African concept in those societies. Uh, where did they get from? Where would the average Japanese citizen come to the conclusion that African peoples are inferior culture? Because the system was globalized. And it's not a function of whether it took place in your country or my country. The concept of enslavement, of <coughs> enslavement became a global concept. And all those countries that did not experience it directly the philosophies and the ideologies are still rooted in their culture. And that becomes very, very interesting. Some of you may recall um, a Japanese pr prime minister having to apologize to Jesse Jackson for some statement which was made in relation to money and corporate relationships and things of that kind. So that becomes very interesting in itself. So the first step in reparations is to, is to apologize. The apology is an admission of guilt. It also leads to an acceptance of responsibility for the consequences of the offense. Now that's an interesting one again. I apologize because I admit that what was done was wrong, and I admit responsibility for the consequences of the offense. Now that becomes very interesting because how many of you here are willing to take responsibility for your great, great, great grandparents? Then that becomes interesting. <coughs> You can very well say that it wasn't me. Fucking so you can. Question is, do you admit that you have benefited and do you feel the privilege, do you know the privilege of the actions taken by your ancestors? That becomes an interesting concept in law. As I said, you cannot go into court with it. If you go to court, of course, you can't get very far, which is why <coughs> historically it had to deal with this and not judges, because you cannot go to court 
with those kinds of concepts, you do not win. Then you have to commit that we will never do it again. So first you apologize. You admit responsibility. You take responsibility. Then you commit to never doing it again. Now that's tricky. That's tricky. Um, do we have to commit as a nation that we will never do this again? And then finally, you have to commit to repairing the damage that you have done. That is what reparations is all about. The four stages. Now this is how reparations is set out in law in the four stages. The apology, acceptance of responsibility, commit but never to do it again, and then to repair the damage that you have done. Very, very difficult. Now, we were in Durban in 2001, and the British government made it clear to us that they could not, under any circumstance, apologize. Now, if you don't wish to apologize, which is a legal concept, and it's a tricky one, you know, the apology is a trap, you know, you step in there, you're in big trouble. But if you don't want to step in there, you get around it. You, you issue a statement of regret. Now, a statement of regret is an interesting legal device that enables you to settle the matter. A statement of regret does not commit you to repairing the damage. It does not commit you to accepting responsibility. It merely says, <coughs> slavery was a horrible human tragic development. <coughs> and we regret it. We genuinely regret that it happened. And that's the end of the story. You have no other obligation. That is it. So, most of the governments of the world, most of the governments, President Clinton did it, the Queen of England has now done it, they have now said we all deeply regret this. And they have all issued statements of regret on behalf of their countries and their nations. But not one <coughs> issued the apology. Because if you do that, the following things will follow. Now, the Queen of England is in a very difficult situation because if she issues an apology, then the royal family have to start forking out those pies. <laughs> because any ordinary historian could demonstrate 1672, the Royal African Company was established. It was owned by the royal family. The Duke of York was the president. The major stakeholders were all members of the royal family. It made millions and millions, and it went on and on. And this first British multinational corporation went out there and brought over two million Africans to the Caribbean. It was owned by the royal family and their associates. Now, the profits were re-employed in castles and large estates and what have we. And we can measure it because we have the records of the Royal African Company and we know how much profits they made and we know what prices they charge and we can do all the calculations on the profitability of the Royal African Company and we can then say to the Queen as the, 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 the matriarch of a family, well, this is what we have calculated. And of course, they are fully aware of that. Hence, there will be no apology. <laughs> so, these are some of the issues that we have had to, to deal with. Now, then we, we go to Durban. Now, that was really an exercise. The United Nations agreed in 2001 to host this major international discussion on racism, xenophobia, and what have you. And we gathered in South Africa. Most countries of the world uh, sent their delegations uh, to discuss this matter. And you know how uh, UN conferences, how they work national delegations. I was asked by the government of Barbados to represent my country and to lead that delegation uh, to this conference. Now, we arrived all excited. Uh, the first morning of the conference, uh, speculation in the corridor, there will be no conference. I mean, people travel from all over the world to attend this conference in the morning, the, <coughs> told the conference is called off. 
And of course, panic is everywhere. Why? Because the word reparations is on the agenda. <laughs> on the agenda of the UN conference is the word reparations. The Americans, of course, have already said two days before that they were not attending because reparations was on the agenda. And Secretary of State Powell had made the most extraordinary statement um, that issues of race and racism, slavery and so on, these are domestic matters. And we will discuss these matters domestically in our country. We are not going to go overseas to ventilate our domestic business. So if reparations is on the agenda, we're not coming. So he's out there. So no US delegation. <coughs> then the British and French and all of the Western countries then said, unless it is removed from the agenda, we are boycotting the conflict. Now, the Western nations. Who are the Western nations? Interesting. Two categories. The West fell into two categories. And when the UN goes into conference, they divide the world into sections, right? And the sections interact with each other. So there were five sections. Uh, there was the European Union section, which included Eastern Europe. So there was something called the European Union Bloc, and that was a bloc at the table. Then Africa was another bloc. Then Asia was a bloc, Asia minus Japan. <laughs> okay? Asia minus Japan. Then there was a fourth group called the, called the Western Group. Now, the Western Group is, is separate and distinct from the European Union. The Western Group includes Canada, Australia, which is interesting, <laughs> New Zealand, and Japan. Now, Japan is in the Western group. So the Western group is Canada, Australia, Japan, and New Zealand. That's the Western bloc. Latin America and the Caribbean, one bloc. Asia minus Japan, one bloc. Africa and the European Union. And these five blocks of persons are at the table now debating what to do with reparations. Now, we spent two and a half hours in the morning trying to handle this crisis because Africa and the Caribbean, Latin America said, it has to stay. We want to discuss it. The European Union and the Western group says, if it stays, we are out of here. So you go into caucus, lock the door, keep the, kick the press out, and we go into horse trading. Now, those of us in the Africa bloc, Caribbean, Latin America, Asia, we want to have a discussion. So we're prepared to compromise. And the compromise position was interesting. The compromise position was, OK, we will leave it on the agenda, but we'll put an asterisk next to it. And we'll put it in parenthesis. <laughs> so we'll leave it on the agenda, with a little asterisk. The asterisk says, uh, any decision made in relation to this subject is not binding on any participant. So, in other words, we can discuss it, but the discussions would have no meaning and significance in law. So that is how the conference proceeded with the, the brackets and the asterisks. Now, so we started our discussions on reparations. The European Union bloc, first out of, out of the blocks, they said, well, as far as we're concerned, the matter of slavery and slave trading are historically remote and not subject to contemporary <coughs> policies. And therefore, we <coughs> do not see how the subject can attract reparations. Uh, the Western bloc said, ditto. Uh, the African bloc then said, well, no, these issues are crimes against humanity. There's something called international law. International law removes the concept of remoteness and focuses directly upon continuity uh, in these subjects. Of course, the Americans were not there, so they had no point of view. Now, we go into recess after the first salvos, OK? Then we reconvene, and the cars are reshuffled on the table. Countries that were demanding to have it on the agenda are now arguing for its removal. So things, musical chairs begin to happen. 
you realize that this is the politics, the pressure was coming down on individual countries. Pressure was coming down on individual countries. And countries began to back away and soften their position. And you know, it's, it's a case of, you know, you're full of grand charge, but then you look back and there's no one behind you. Because the circumstances have changed. Nigeria, largest country in Africa. The main victim of this slave trade at least, at least 10 of those 15 million people have been ripped out of the Nigeria hinterland, devastated by the African slave trade. The president of Nigeria says that I have no interest in discussing matters of reparations. It's not relevant to my country's national or foreign policy. We do not want to discuss it. What we want to discuss is direct foreign investment from the West. Fine. Nothing wrong with that. That's his position. Now, meanwhile, next door to the intergovernmental conference is an NGO conference. And the Nigerian national NGO movement have sent a delegation to Durban to demand a full ventilation of the subject. So the people of Nigeria <coughs> wanted to discuss reparations. The government did not want to discuss reparations. Classic case of people versus government uh, on a major issue. But we cannot demonize anyone. The question is why is it, why is it that the Nigerian government took that position? Simple. Their fear that this discussion about reparations would not fit neatly into a black-white paradigm. It will not fit neatly into a Western European African black discourse. And it will spill out and become messy and nasty everywhere because then in West Africa, in his country, Nigeria, which is a federation of several, several ethnic groups and historical nations, he is fearful that his country is going to break up if there is a major discussions, domestic cable reparations, because the Igbos, the Igbos, the largest nation in the East, are ready and waiting to speak about the Falanis who have been shipping them and enslaving them, and the Yorubos who acted as middlemen on the river, and they want reparations against the Yorubos. <coughs> and the Igbos are getting ready to launch their campaign domestically. We don't want reparations from the English. We want them from the Yorubos. Because it's the Yorubos who sold us to the English in the first place. So first of all, we want domestic reparations from these guys next door and then we will deal with the English after. <laughs> but the president of Nigeria cannot imagine his country descending into that kind of discussion, so he closed the gate immediately. Then the president of Senegal took the same position. President Wad came on and said, um, difficult, because he was aware of the challenges. He was aware, and he felt that the Wolofs might be targeted and that the Mandingos were getting ready to have a discussion with the Wolofs about their relationship in the 18th century. The Mandingos feel very unhappy that they were targeted, and the Wolofs have done well financially out of it. So he too feared uh, a civil war. And bear in mind, Africa at the moment is riddled with these kind of national and ethnic issues. So the two main countries took a decision. Now, the African countries that were not directly, centrally at the heart of the slave trade were the ones that took the firmest positions. So Zimbabwe said, yes, we are standing behind the diaspora people. There must be a discussion of reparations. It's easy for Zimbabwe to say that. Algeria said that. And I should tell you, the president of um, Algeria made a great statement. Great statement. He spoke about the Civil War, the War of National Liberation, the war against the French. He spoke of Fats Fanon and he said that it was a great West Indian intellectual who focused the imagination to give them and we owe them something. Uh, the Zimbabwe Minister of Foreign Affairs made a great statement. He said, when we were out there in the bush fighting against Ian Smith, uh, things were very hard. We used to play Bob Marley's music. And Bob Marley's music kept us going in the bush. And it was nice we were fighting guerrilla wars. We will liberate Zimbabwe. And all of us had Bob Marley's music. And we won that war because of Bob Marley. 
and therefore we owe the people of the Caribbean to stand by them. <laughs> uh, and so, so Africa splintered, and with Africa splintered, then the discussion became very, very difficult. Now, then we said, okay, well, let us see what we can salvage from this conference. Let us focus on the, the, the most tragic case of all. Let's look at Haiti. Let's talk about Haiti. And I propose that we put Haiti on the agenda. Haiti was the first country in the world to pay reparations. That became very interesting. The people of Haiti launched their revolution, <coughs> won their independence, freedom, self, and slavery, declared in 1804 the national independence, and it evolved. Could not get recognition from the Western world. Could not get, <coughs> could not get recognition from France. Haiti then became the center of an international trade blockade. Young nation, young nation, like the American nation, the second independent nation in the hemisphere, modeling their own craft on the American experience, starting out in the context of international trade blockade. On the 21st anniversary of Haiti's independence, 18, 1825, 21st anniversary, the Western world has not yet recognized Haiti's independence. Major celebrations at Port-au-Prince, 21 years of freedom, of national independence. And the French government said, okay, if you want us to recognize your independence, you pay us reparations. The American government said, yes, we will recognize you if France recognizes you. Britain, Holland, Germany said, we will recognize you if France recognizes you. France said, if you want recognition as an independent nation, you must pay us reparations. All the slaves, including yourselves, because many of the statesmen, many of the, the, the presidents and the vice presidents and the ministers of government, they were former slaves, so they had to put a value on themselves. So the French government said, we want to be repaid for the two or three million slaves that we <coughs> lost in that country. We want our money back. All the plantations, all the houses, all the buildings, <coughs> all the stuff that we lost when you became independent, we want it repaired. And the French government sent down to Italy a team of accountants and financiers, and they went to work. And they calculated that value at 150 million francs. So, Haiti had no choice. If they wanted to join the community of free and independent nations, then they had to pay for it. So, they signed a treaty with the French government to pay back 150 million francs. And this was on the 21st anniversary of the national independence. Now, that way, they did get recognition, and the state of Haiti was recognized by the West. But, Haiti did not pay, did not finish paying that reparations until 1897. No, I tell you a lie. 1922. 1922, Haiti finally paid its last cent, or its last franc, to the French government. It took them almost 100 years, almost 197 years, to pay back France that reparations. And I should tell you, those of, you, those of us who have looked at the economic history of France, of Haiti, in many decades in the 19th century, the 1860s, the 1870s, the reparation payment was as much as 60% of the gross earnings of that state. 60% for many years of Haiti's entire national income was paid to France in reparations. The country was bled to death. The country was bled to death. And it, of course it descended into economic chaos, political chaos. So that in 1922, when the final franc was paid, Haiti was in a mess. Of course, the Americans had invaded in 1915 because it was a mess. So we said to the French government, in all humanity, this country is now the poorest country in the hemisphere. Pay them back that money. It was illegal, it should not have been paid, the country has been bled, pay the money 
back to the Caribbean. And that was the position that all the Caribbean governments endorsed. All the Caribbean governments and Durban, in the last ditch, <coughs> called upon the French government. The French government has said all along, we never recognize slavery. The French parliament had already said that slavery was a crime against humanity. We say, no, well, okay, put your money where your mouth is, pay back those poor people. Of course, Aristide was listening very carefully. And he did his own calculations. He did his own calculations. Aristide calculated that the contemporary value, the contemporary value of that 150 million gold francs was $21 billion. And a team from the IMF helped to calculate this, and it was indeed $21 billion of contemporary money. And therefore, Aristide made, in July 2003, Aristide made a formal intergovernmental uh, presentation to the French government requesting the repayment of $21 billion. He was out of office in three months. It was the first time that one government had placed reparations proposals to another government. They had never happened before. It's the first and last time it has happened. That one government asked for reparations against another government. Three weeks later, he was out of office. Now, it is quite clear why he was removed from office. He was removed from office by a coalition of French and American soldiers. Uh, the French, of course, had suddenly had an interest in removing Aristide from office. Now, he had asked that this money ought to go towards investment in education and healthcare. And this proposal was made in the context of the 24th Annual Conference of the Caribbean Heads of Governments meeting in Montego Bay. So this was within the context of the Caribbean governments and the annual conference, and this was a formal, a formal request. Now, therein lies the politics. So Haiti then became the first case of reparation payments. Haiti becomes the first case of a leader who is removed because he's taken the matter seriously. So Haiti again is at the center of it all. Now last year, um, the British media, following the RST situation, uh, took a decision to engage in effective calculation of what reparations <coughs> would be if the British government had to pay it. Now, I was fascinated by the British approach because this was not a bunch of extremists and radicals and hotheads and so on that normally you would say, oh, you can ignore them, so the establishment would say. And the establishment quite easily said, oh, they're a bunch of comments, forget them. What they did, they assembled a team of, of, of city financiers, <coughs> highly respected financiers, cost accountants, brokers, mathematicians, and they took them out of the major respected firms of the city, like JP Morgan and so on, respected firms, took them out and say, let us work through the information. Let's calculate this matter. How much would Britain have to pay if it dealt with the question of the unpaid wages, unpaid wages to seven million slaves, compensation for the pain and suffering, and compensation for the loss of property. Uh, this, is an, this is an approved methodology of international law, because many of the Africans would have lost their properties back home, they lost their houses, their domestic effects, and if you're gonna take people out of their community and ship them across an ocean, then you have to reasonably calculate what were their domestic um, capital, their values, <coughs> and, and use all of the techniques of economic history to say, well, we know what values were in the 18th century West Africa. We know what wages are, were in Western Europe in the 18th century. Let us take those standards and uh, calculate what the reparation charge would be if Britain had to settle this matter uh, once and for all. And this highly respected team of city, city financiers came up with a figure of 7.5 trillion pounds. 7.5 trillion pounds. That is more than the gross capital product of Great Britain. This program, this information was presented in the context of a program that was aired on television, uh, I think it was in November last year. 
Um, I was asked to be a participant in that program, <coughs> um, uh, speaking about the issues of trade. And I think the British public was actually shocked to hear their respected bankers and merchants, uh, people from Barclays Bank and all these other respected places, saying, well, to close this chapter in history, we would have to find 7.5 trillion pounds. Now, that figure seems horrendously absurd <coughs> to the average British citizen. This is more than the whole GDP of the country. Well, we're gonna find 7.5 trillion. But therein, therein lies, therein lies the calculation. But it speaks to the magnitude of the issue. So, how can the British Parliament, even if the British legislature wants to deal with this, how can they go, how can Prime Minister Blair go into the House of Commons to say, well, we want to move on. The time has come for us to put this behind us and move on. Let us settle this matter. I need, I need to vote a revenue measure of 7.5 trillion pounds. <laughs> and and we, will, we will find ways in which we can, we can do this. Now, in Durban, and this is my final point, I know it's very long and exhausting. In Durban, we have said that reparation strategies ought to focus on community development. <coughs> this notion of people standing up on street corners getting checks is nonsense and nonsense. <laughs> we, we, we need community development. In my own, in my own island, Barbados, um, this is the first state society in the hemisphere, I've mentioned. There isn't a museum of African culture. There isn't a museum of African civilization. 95% of the people are descendants of slaves and there isn't. Because a proper, well-developed museum as an educational instrument is a very expensive undertaking. If you take, for example, curriculum development, to fully equip our schools with appropriate literature for young black kids to read, is a very expensive undertaking. <coughs> curriculum reform, curriculum review, <coughs> textbook development is a very complex and expensive operation. Um, black kids are still reading Humpty Dumpty and all that kind of stuff. And Dan is the man in the van, and you know Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall and cracked it up in primary school. But to have proper, appropriate literature focusing on the images of their own culture and ancestry. It's a very expensive undertaking, so we say, okay, let us talk about reparations in the context of community empowerment. Schools, education, museums, art galleries, scholarships, things of that kind, where a community can repair by its own initiatives, a community can seek to repair its own self through investments and in its own infrastructure. And this is how we had proposed to proceed. And I think that in Durban, in Durban, there was an understanding that that was the way to go. Certainly most of the countries in Western Europe agreed that that was the way to go with the reparation discourse. Now, because Barbados had held the center with the strategy, Barbados was targeted as the center for the follow-up conference, okay? So the follow-up conference was held at a place called the Sherburn Conference Center in Barbados, the follow-up to the Durban Conference, where we would meet and sit down and work out all of these strategies to get involved in bilateral agreements, multilateral agreements, to deal with issues of investments in public health care, education, cultural institutions, and so on. Conference convened. 500 people came, wonderful conference. And the first morning of the conference, a gentleman stood up and said, I would like to pass, to propose a resolution to this conference. Took the floor. May it be resolved that all of the white people should leave this room immediately, that this is a discussion among black people. <laughs> and the resolution was passed. The majority of delegates passed the resolution, and the white people were asked to leave the room. Now, I was leading a university delegation to the conference. And here I am, in a provost of a campus, 
a historian, <coughs> the person who had led the national delegation to the UN conference. So I took my team and I walked out the conference. Now, having walked out the conference, my government then denounced the conference. And the conference spiraled into disorder because we discovered that a large number of extremists had actually come to the conference with the intention of derailing the dialogue. So from this country, the black Muslim group came. And the black Muslim group came in, and they were the ones who proposed the resolution. Then the Rastafaris of Great Britain, they second. <laughs> so between the black Muslims and the Rastafaris, that was the end of the conference, and, and, it, and it collapsed. Now, when it collapsed, we asked a number of questions. How do you know if you're white or not? And this is what I asked in the discussion. <laughs> While I was trying to persuade colleagues not to accept this resolution, I said, well, how do we know? Do, do we just look at a person and assume that because their skin has a different color than white, how do we know? I propose that we do a blood test on everyone right now. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that was my company proposal, that we should do a DNA test before we make a decision as to whether you should leave the conference or not. And we had the equipment at the hospital. At the <laughs> and I, was willing, I was willing to go to the campus and bring down the equipment to test every one of the conferences and we make a decision. And we say, yes, if you are jet white, according to your blood, you have to eat. <laughs> then we ask the second question. How about families? How about interracial families? Uh, the mother can stay, the father has to go. The father can go, the mother, how the children? How, should half the children go and half stay? Um, how do we handle the children, the mixed race children? What do we do with them? Uh, so these kinds of questions were asked. But what you were dealing with then was a different devil. Different. And this suggests, this suggests the ways in which the finest devil, the, the most philosophically <coughs> significant devil, can in fact be reduced to trivia <coughs> and the matter of sabotage and abandonment. And that period was my last exposure to this devil. Um, of course, having left the room with my delegation, I was then <coughs> branded by the extremists as, a, as a, an Uncle Tom <coughs> and a, a turncoat. But therein lies the issue. It's precisely the issue. This is a highly charged emotional issue. And what I wanted to share with you, uh, the politics of it, very, very complicated. And to be honest with you, I can only conclude by suggesting, I do not know where this is going to go. I feel somewhat like Star Trek, you know? <laughs> we don't know where we're going, but let us try. Thank you. <laughs> royal ships. 
his name was on it, the crest was on it. And so they brought the ship up from the depths of the icy water. And when they brought the ship up and put it on the coast, by God, it was a slave ship. It was a slave ship. It was the king's slave ship. All the shackles were on it, all the chains and all the stuff and the ivory. It was on its way back from Norway, back to West Africa to bring slaves to take them to their colonies in the Danish Caribbean. Now, the, the Norwegian people as a community were not told through their history books that they were involved in the slave trade. They had no idea and they were shocked. The nation was stunned by this. So part of Norway's atonement was to vote money to fund the whole first phase of the slave ship. Of the slave ship project. So Norway has been funding us for five years as part of their own atonement. Now, many Islamic nations are opposed to the project. Why? Because more Africans, more West Africans were taken across the Sahara into the Middle East than across the Atlantic into the Americas. So the largest market for enslaved Afri West Africans was in fact the Islamic nations. Uh, so we said, okay, let us first of all study the Atlantic trade, then we'll study the Trans-Sahara trade. So we have enormous problems uh, from countries like Saudi Arabia and so on who want no part of it. So, but it has, it has to go on. So therein lies uh, one of the challenges. Could you comment a bit about what you think the Rastafarians and the, and, the, and the Muslims from the United States were thinking when they apparently purposely derailed that, that, that Congress? Were they concerned that this would just be a, a settlement, as, as you put it, and therefore, since it's not the pure reparation, it should be completely stopped? What, I, think, I think that was part of it. I think there were those who felt that uh, where it was going was towards settlement. Uh, and that reparation is a much larger, bigger concept, which is okay. But I felt too that um, the, the nature of the dialogue um, had become, as far as they're concerned, rather academic. It was dominated by scholars, lawyers, and various people who were working through international law, national law, and finding a way through this process uh, using the finest research we could muster. Um, but then again, I thought maybe there was something else. And, um, I certainly felt, um, you know, each time I watched the, the Malcolm X film, uh, the Spike Lee film, and there's that moment, you know, when uh, Malcolm X knows that he's going to die, and he knows that he's going to die at the hands of one of his own, and there's that airy feeling of walking to your death. At that conference, when I walked in there that morning, I felt that. I felt the chill of something strange was happening in that morning, and so when the resolution was and pass, I was not surprised because I could feel that something. And